I'm James McGrath Morris, and we're here today in the Palace Press. Behind me stand some early printing presses, and this seemed like an absolutely perfect place to talk about the man who revolutionized American newspapers. When I first started working on the book, people would react with recognition when I said I was writing about Joseph Pulitzer, but it was clear from their expressions they knew the name and not anything about his life, because Pulitzer shares this fate with Alfred Nobel of being well known for a prize which he endowed, but not for what he did in his life. Very few people remember that Alfred Nobel was an explosives or a munitions maker, and very few people understand the significant role that Joseph Pulitzer played in American history. Yet, like some of the giants of the 18th century whose names we remember, Carnegie, Morgan, Rockefeller, all of these people, Pulitzer played a significant role at a critical moment in American history, which is the Industrial Age. That's the age that made America the way we think of ourselves today. And the role he played is he was really the midwife at the birth of the modern mass media. Before his time, we didn't have the kind of media that we now swim in every day. The notion of Americans, you know, checking their news on their, on their, ha on their phones or going to CNN or watching C-SPAN, these are all things that were cultivated in that period. So it turns out that Pulitzer not only played a historically significant role in the 19th century, led a fascinating life which made for great reading, but the influence that he yielded still is with us today. The reason I think people don't remember Pulitzer today as much is because in some ways his accomplishment is so happenstance now. We're so used to what it is. In the 19th century, printing was the internet. We all go, you know, wow, I can book a ticket now, or I have this little gadget, and we, every day we exclaim. And so the idea of getting news today quickly and easily are all commonplace things, and we don't think it's such a big deal in evaluating it. In the same way, I'm not so sure all Americans really remember who Morgan was, or who Rockefeller was, or who Carnegie was, yet we drive across bridges made with steel, that's a Carnegie gift. We're using cars powered by oil. That's all the world that Rockefeller built. And we're using a financial system built on Morgan. And we're consuming news built on a system that was developed and created by people like Pulitzer. Pulitzer was born in the 1840s. He came to the United States as a mercenary soldier to fight in the Civil War. The North needed soldiers, and they went to Europe and recruited single young men, promising passage here. He didn't really see any action. Like many veterans after the war, he was unemployed. Often after war, it's hard to reintegrate people into, uh, into the economy. He ends up in St. Louis, where he becomes befriended by a major uh, German-American named Karl Schurz, who becomes a senator from Missouri and is a newspaper publisher. Pulitzer enters the world of the press at that point. He's doing everything at an extraordinary rate, which we don't do anymore, but it's very interesting to compare his life to modern-day immigrants. Within five years of his entry in the United States, he's elected a state legislator in Missouri. Um, it's that kind of speed of integration that we had in the 19th century when people were coming. He becomes fabulously successful, and I'm really shortening the story, in St. Louis as the publisher of the Post-Dispatch, inventing a very new form of journalism. Let me give you a comparison. Pulitzer is much like the modern-day surfer. What I mean by that is if you go to a beach and you look out on the water, beyond where the waves are breaking, you see men and women just paddling lazily their surfboards. Suddenly one of them paddles with extraordinary speed, and because they perceive that little undulation in the water is going to be the best wave of the day, the others don't. They don't see it. Well, what Pulitzer was seeing in the 19th century were tidal waves of social change that he was going to ride. What were they? Well, people were leaving the farms and coming to the cities and working in factories. They were becoming commuters. Women who had made important economic decisions in the farms were now becoming housewives. Paper was being made with such, a, with such strength out of wood, not out of cloth, that could go through printing presses at high speed that it became possible to print a newspaper, thousands of copies, and get it out in the street. The Victorian Internet had been invented, that's the telegraph, bringing news from Washington, D.C. that morning. So what happened in Congress would reach St. Louis in the afternoon. So Pulitzer produced an afternoon paper that he could sell to commuters that was entertaining to read, that contained economic information, advertising, so the wives would know where to buy gingham or flour. Um, it contained the latest news, so that the next day's papers were actually printing yesterday's news. And he did more than that. He discovered that in urban life there was this tremendous drama that you could write up in a non-fiction way, the way Dickens was writing tales of the poor in London. So the paper was rivetingly interesting to read, and all of these elements combined into what people then called Western, because St. Louis was considered West, Western journalism. 
And so like a Broadway play, you know, they test Broadway plays out in the hinterlands before they bring them to New York. Well, Pulitzer did the same thing. He brought his style of newspapering to New York City. He bought the bankrupt New York world and within months was making millions of dollars and revolutionized journalism in New York. New York being the media center of the country and the world at that time, he revolutionized journalism. One set of anecdotes that is an analogy for the importance of Pulitzer. As I said, Pulitzer created this newspaper in the New York world in New York. And he looked down to the Lower East Side where the masses of immigrants were coming in the 1880s and 1890s. And when I mean masses, millions of people were coming from overseas. New York was the port of entry. Ellis Island was about to open up. And the upper class and the upper reaches of Fifth Avenue saw these folks as a dangerous group. They saw them as, as uh, poor, dirty, you know, all these kinds of things that they fixed them. Pulitzer didn't see them that way. He saw them as potential readers. So he admonished his reporters to go and write about their lives. So the day's paper would say, Tiny Tot falls to its de his death from a tenement building. And the upper class, drinking their tea with their little fingers up, you know, the cup of tea, say, oh, such sensationalistic prattle. They were missing the point. To the people in the Lower East Side and the black and tan bars and the overcrowded tenements, this was their lives being portrayed in print. Kids did fall to their deaths. In fact, in the summer, it was so hot in those tenement buildings. This is the most densely populated place in the world. People would go up to the roofs to get to breathe at night, and children would fall to their death. And this was chronicled by Jacob Rees, the journalist. So by writing about them, he was, in a sense, dignifying their lives. And I give this comparison all the time. I ask people I bump into, I say, if you were to take me home, I bet you on your refrigerator is a clipping of some sort that you've kept, your child's graduation, your child's accomplishment at school, maybe a sad news and obituary. Those events occurred regardless of whether they're in print or not. So why do we keep these? Because writing in print puts, brings dignity and meaning to actions. So the Lower East Side class of people saw the paper as their friend that produced this kind of dignity. The paper also was the entry to American life. For as little as a penny you could get it. On Sundays you'd get a paper as thick as a, as a telephone book with dress patterns, easy to understand stories, uh, serialization of literature. You know, we download music now into our iPhones. Ha, that's old stuff. Then he printed the sheet music, the latest tune, inside the paper so you could play the latest music in your house. So Pulitzer built this enormously important symbiotic relationship with the poorest people in New York with this paper. And in return, two things happened that were really amazing. One of which is the Statue of Liberty was being given to the United States by the French people. Not by the French government, but by the French people. And in return, we were supposed to raise the money on our own, not the Congress. So the statue was basically on its way over and we hadn't raised the money for the pedestal. So Pulitzer ran a front page story about the scandal that no one has paid for this, an editorial saying, bring me your pennies and nickels. I will put your name in the paper and thank you for it and we will raise the money privately. Now, you have to understand, he's a, a, a baron of the 19th century, so trusted by the lower classes of New York that kids would come in with their pennies, workers would come in with their nickels, and just say, here it is, I trust that you will use this. It's like my going to you know, some major corporate leader today and saying, here's five bucks, I hope you'll use it in the right way. So it amplifies the, the relationship. The next day in the paper, your name would be listed for that contribution. The same paper that had the Vanderbilts, the Astors, and the Morgans in it, there would appear Michael O'Shaughnessy's name for having given a penny. So this, this sculpture's pedestal was built that way, and in time, and the Statue of Liberty was put up, and this is a statue to Pulitzer out in the park where the statue is out in the island. So my last bit of this sort of architectural tour of New York to show you the significance of all this, Pulitzer now has recreated American journalism. It's vital. It's important. Um, the papers are being published every hour of the day. If there's an important trial in New York, like the Harry K. Thaw trial in 1905, a reporter would sit in the room, write his story, hand it to a copy boy who'd go downstairs, pick up an open phone, dictate it back to the paper. They would print that hour's trial, put it out in the streets, and little boys would sell, you know, so-and-so accuses so-and-so. That was the CNN of that time. It was so important that on election night, people would gather by the thousands down on Park Row because there was no radio to tell you who'd win. And you'd look at the front of the newspapers where they had big boards and they'd put the results in chalk.
So Pulitzer became, as I said, the midwife of this whole world of journalism in which people depended on it, turned to news for entertainment. They would say at dinner tonight, did you read that story in the New York world? Or maybe the competitor, but the point is people would talk about news in a way that was all new. So making all this money, he needed to build a new headquarters. So he went down to Park Row and he bought French's Hotel. And this is a great lesson for young people because you always hear that revenge is the dish best served cold. French's Hotel had kicked him out of the lobby as an indigent, unemployed veteran of the Civil War in 1865. So he came back, bought the hotel, tore it down. He built the, then the tallest building on the globe. And at the top, he made, it was a globe, um, dome-shaped building at the top where the editorial offices were, and he put gold leaf on the top. So the top floors of this building, which overlooked all of New York, the tallest building on the globe at this point, was where the newsroom was and where the Pulitzer's offices were. And what's so significant about that is it remade the landscape of New York at this point. Think of it in terms of the Empire State Building in the 20th century, you know, that kind of profound effect. So just like he remade the landscape of journalism, he remade the landscape of New York with this building. And this is the profound moment that I think really illustrates it all. When those immigrants kept coming into New York Harbor, and this is something people forget, when immigrants left the steppes of Russia, there was no Delta flight or Virgin Air flight to go home and see Mama the next year. You were betting your last dollars that you might be able to get away from the oppression you left and reestablish your life in this new land. And so as you enter the harbor, it's a terrific moment. You're going to have your first look at the new land, and if the fog is there, maybe you know, the fog will clear and you'll see the Statue of Liberty. And those immigrants would see that. You go right by the Statue of Liberty, and they wouldn't necessarily know that the pedestal had been built with the pennies and nickels of the ones who came before them. And then they would turn and have their first look at the New York City skyline, the city that would welcome them, the city where they would learn their English, the city where they'd get their first foothold on the American economic life. And if the sun was right, it would be gleaming off the gold dome of the world building, not a monument to commerce, not a monument to banking, not a monument to manufacturing or agriculture, but a monument to the American press, the only constitutionally, explicitly constitutionally protected form of business in the United States in the First Amendment, it says the press, it doesn't say you have the right to make steel, and the New York world that will be their, their ticket to understanding how to get ahead, their ticket to learning English, and their ticket to American politics. That's the effect Pulitzer had back then. He was uh, a very difficult man to live with as a biographer. He was sort of like the Howard Hughes of the 19th century. Uh, at the peak of his power, when he was the publisher of the most, uh, the most powerful publisher on the globe, I mean, his paper had the power of the New York Times, CNN, and the Washington Post, and CBS News all combined. I mean, it was, people read the world in the way that that people, in the, and when I was a child, used to watch the three networks on TV. It's immense influence. So he reached this enormous pinnacle of power and he began to go blind. So like Beethoven, who couldn't hear his own music, Pulitzer couldn't read his own, his own paper. And at the same time, he became beset with a number of psychological issues, and one of which was sound disturbed him. So he built in Maine, for instance, a famous Tower of Silence, a room in which he could go in and get refuge from sound. His New York City mansion had a special bedroom which was separated, had separate walls, inch thick plate glass to keep the noise out. Um, if you were invited to have lunch with him and you ate your celery in a fashion that was too noisy, you'd get a memo the next day saying, uh, next time you have lunch with Mr. Pulitzer, no crunch crunch please. So the, this became an obsession for him and he became obsessively um, beset with all these problems. So. Uh, the second half of his life, he got on his yacht, the world's largest yacht, well, be correct, Morgan's was three feet bigger, but one of these massive yachts. The engines were put in a special part of the yacht so the sound wouldn't reach him, and he basically went back and forth across the world. And one of the most daring writers that worked for him, David Philip Graham, a very famous novelist who was later assassinated by one of his readers, wrote him a note in which he had the courage to say to Mr. Pulitzer that your problems are not the kind you can flee geographically. A geographical solution to what you have isn't what you need. Pulitzer, as I told you, was an impossible man to live with. Once his daughter had a minor operation, uh, very commonplace with kids, but involved some bleeding. So the household was in the tizzy. It would be a teenage daughter upstairs and all that. And Pulitzer stands up at the dining room table and a, and a waiter had written this down and said, hey folks, what about me? I'm suffering here. So his self-centeredness, 
his egomania, his social issues makes him an um, absolutely fascinating character and we're able to understand it better today. But the thing I loved the best about the book was that his wife Kate understood it better than any of us did. Um, she loved him in a way that no one else could love him and as he went blind she took a locket he had with a painting of his mother and what we'd have done today is gone to Kinko's and enlarged it. She had a painter paint a really large version so that before he could lose all his eyesight he could still see his mother. So, and then later I portray that at one point she does have an affair and I think the sense that readers have at that point is, you go girl. I mean, he was just so impossible. People say, you know, what, are, what is Joseph Pulitzer's legacy? And his legacy is, has two parts to it. He gave, left in his will money to create two things. One is the journalism school at Columbia University, which is just celebrating its centennial right now. This is very important. It isn't just Columbia University. I will admit that Missouri has a journalism school, Kansas, I mean, there are many training things. But what's important about it is that Pulitzer came to realize that journalism, like any profession, whether it's being a lawyer or a dentist, required professional training. So he took his money to create a school by which people could become professionally trained to become journalists because it is a responsible craft. And what I think is so important about his legacy is I think that a lot of the solutions to the modern mass media's problems today will come out of those institutions where younger people are trying to become journalists and they have to figure out a way, just like Pulitzer figured out a way, to make it work. So in a sense, the next Pulitzer may come out of the school he created. So that's one important legacy. The other is the Pulitzer Prize. The Pulitzer Prize was money he left behind to reward journalists and newspapers and writers and artists and other people for great contributions. And there are two aspects of it that are significant. One, if you get it, it of course changes your life. I mean, the joke is now you know what the first three words of your, uh, of your obituary will be because it says Pulitzer Prize winner so and so passed away. But that reflects the power of that gift, of that, of that prize. Now, a century after Pulitzer's death, we're still honoring people using Pulitzer's name. The other thing it does is it does something that shares with the Nobel Peace Prize. If you look carefully, Nobel Peace Prize is often given to people who are in danger. Um, you know, it could be an, a woman in Burma standing up for democracy. It could be a group trying to bring about peace in a dangerous place like Northern Ireland. And the reason the prize is given is in a sense to protect that person because you're not going to go and assassinate somebody who just won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's bringing world attention to them. Well, the most significant Pulitzer Prize is the one for public service. And it's often given to newspapers who have been daringly covering something their community didn't want them to cover. And when they cover something the community doesn't want them to cover, the journalists are ostracized. The, the local towns often pull out their advertisements, which is the economic base, and the newspapers take a tremendous risk to write about something that could be a scandal, it could be something important, but the community you know, doesn't want to hear about it. And when they get the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, it's a recognition, national recognition of the importance of what they've done, and in a sense provides that same kind of umbrella of protection that the Nobel Peace Prize does to people who are daring. Pulitzer was an extraordinarily significant person who still to this day affects our lives. And just like you know, a child may uh, recognize all of a sudden they have a mannerism from their father or mother or a habit, you, know, you suddenly say, oh, I'm just like my mother, you know, and you, you recognize those roots. We as a culture need to understand that a lot of the habits we have today come from people who, who came before us. When you read Pulitzer, you begin to understand a lot of the traits we have about consumption of news, understanding of news, news as a form of entertainment. I mean, these are all radical notions from his time that we inherited and have taken on to build our society. Um, the other thing that I think is perhaps really important about Pulitzer, and we need to think about it in the seismic in the seismic change that's going on with the American media, Pulitzer hammered away over and over again that the newspaper business is not just a business. There's a public service aspect to it. That a democracy cannot function without an informed public. That somebody has to be at that school board meeting at 2 o'clock in the morning when they're voting on a contract as to who's going to build the next school. And as the press shrinks today, there are no people at those meetings keeping an eye on things. And 
The press ultimately lights the darkest recesses of our society. We know about the hardships about poverty, whether we want it to or not, because of the press. We know about corruption in the government and it gets fixed because of the press. We know about what's on the public agenda and sometimes too much, you know, like the fiscal cliff we hear about over and over again. But these are critically important roles that the press plays and I think Pulitzer's story is a reminder of that that yes, these are businesses run by the Salzburgers of the New York Times, the Grahams of the Washington Post, but they perform this enormously important civic active, um, action of informing us. And the question we have to deal with as a society is, as these papers no longer can support themselves, what will come next to replace them? So that would be part of what I hope people would take away from the book.